Wow, thank you, Patrice. This is an incredible gift. Thank you. <laughs> I can't wait until the, the rest of the world gets to see this film. So um, we are, we're now gonna turn from screening into, uh, into conversation and I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge how challenging it is to make that transition. Um, so I'm gonna just invite us to take a, take a big breath We'll take a big inhale and exhale. Thank you to all of you for showing up tonight to be part of this really vital conversation for, for our community, for our city, and really for our country. We've seen over the course of the um, last couple of years in all of the reports that come out, whether from the FBI or from the ADL, there's been a persistent and an alarming rise in anti-Semitic incidents. And these are tracking not only swastikas that are carved into desks of our children in school, but also cases of assault and harassment um, and, and real violence. Um, these are also coupled with recent surveys that say now that nearly 20% of Americans hold anti-Semitic views. If that's the number that's willing to answer yes to the survey, then we have to assume that the number is significantly higher. At the same time that our Jewish community is obviously rightfully very concerned about this uh, growing number of anti-Semitic incidents and this very dangerous trend line, we also have witnessed continued acts um, of real violence against many other impacted communities in this country, especially the black community. I think many of us watched in absolute horror the massacre in Buffalo that targeted black Americans. We know that the rise of anti-black hate crimes is really um, something that we're very, very concerned about both in Los Angeles and around the country. We've also seen a flourishing of anti-Asian, of anti-immigrant, of anti-trans violence uh, throughout the country. All of this while we continue as a country to fail to counter the gun epidemic, leaving weapons of war easily accessible in nearly every city in this country. All of these are things that we're gonna be speaking about this evening. And even more important than the numbers, we know that each time one of these hate crimes occurs, like the attack in Pittsburgh, there is a deep reverberative trauma that, um, that tears through the community and ripples out beyond the community. And one of the things I was thinking about as I watched the film, both in preparation for tonight and again tonight, is that when the Walmart shooting happened, all of the people who were survivors of the previous mass shootings once again experienced uh, the trauma, as, as we know is happening. With every one of these mass shootings, there's, a, there's again a, a repetition of the trauma in the system. So we really can't underestimate um, the price that is being paid uh, as a country for really the very toxic confluence of hatred and g access to guns in this country. The cost that is now being paid by Jewish and black and Latino and Muslim and Sikh and Native American and LGBTQ communities. The question for us tonight is what we can do about it. What can we do so that we collectively can be stronger than hate? So tonight we're gonna to talk about the film specifically with the resonances that might echo here in Los Angeles and how each of our really extraordinary leaders here envisions building alliances and structures that will address anti-Semitism, racism, and gun violence. Our objective tonight is to transform some of the horror and terror that we experience when we're witnessing a film like this and really see, really being reminded of the terrible trauma that we experience into a sense of power, a sense of hope, and a real sense of possibility. We're so blessed to have some of our most extraordinary leaders um, join us for this incredible conversation. Um, so I wanna start by inviting Mayor Karen Bass, Mayor of the City of Los Angeles, to please come join me on stage. Thank you so much. 
Mayor Bass, uh, who has been an incredible friend to our Jewish community throughout the course of her work and who every day is working to build a more just and loving society uh, in our country and right here in the city. And we're just so blessed to have you working uh, and directing your efforts on the local front now. So we thank you so much. We have our newest congressperson, Sydney Kamlager Dove, who was recently elected representative from the 37th uh, district in Los Angeles. And it is uh, with great joy that we welcome you here as well, and that we get to send you to, to DC. Thank you. And of course, um, our dear friend, Congressman, Congress member Adam Schiff, um, who is in his 12th term serving the 30th Congressional District in Los Angeles. He is a leading member of the House Judiciary Committee. He is currently on leave from the House Appropriations Committee. Um, he is a strong and powerful voice for what is just and good in this city um, and in the country, and we're so grateful. You know, um, Sam Hutman, as I think we all know, is truly a force of nature. Um, and I never doubted that Sam could do anything she set her mind to, but when Sam Hutman called me and said, guess what? We have Mayor Bass, we have Representative Kamlager Dove, and we have Representative Schiff. I just, it just took my breath away. I am so, thank you, Sam, for conceiving of this um, and putting this together. Um, thank you to Sam's wonderful partners in this work, Carl Thurmond and Nick Roxborough, who are here um, tonight as well. And of course, to all of our co-sponsors for making this possible. And, and really, thank you to the three of you. I know you're very busy people. You have a lot of important work to do. So we're deeply grateful um, to have you here with us now. In a, in a few moments, we're gonna invite up our two other panelists, um, Aziza Hassan and Patrice O'Neill, to talk more about this film. But first, we wanted to have a moment um, just with the three of you. I, I have to say, I've never, I experienced something I've never experienced before tonight when watching this film. I kinda wanted to move to Pittsburgh. Um, <laughs> I, it will pass. I'm very happy here in LA, but, <laughs> um, but, but to see the city come together the way that the city of Pittsburgh ha uh, really came together in light of this tragedy is quite, uh, is quite remarkable. And I wanna just um, invite you to reflect for a moment if you could, and maybe we'll start with you, Representative Schiff, if that's okay. Um, your reflections to uh, to what we just witnessed, and then we'll we'll make our way um, over here. Um, I mean, we live in a city that is truly one of the most diverse cities in the entire world, um, and we have an extraordinary multi faith and multiracial network that works here. Um, that has really that has built, I think, a very great um, sense of hope and possibility for many of us. At the same time, I know that there's so much more that needs to be done. And while I've seen the three of you and many of your colleagues here show up again and again and again in all the moments where it matters most, I don't want for us to have to show up in these moments anymore. Um, and the reason that we have to keep coming out to speak out in this way is because the violence persists and the hatred persists. And to be honest, not enough people are stepping forward when it matters. So I wanna just invite you to, to, to offer for one moment um, what resonates for you from this story about Tree of Life and how you envision that we might be able to build a better and, and stronger city. Uh, Rabbi, thank you for inviting us and, and uh, to Sam and Nick and Carl, thank you for uh, helping to organize uh, this get together as well. Wonderful to see my colleagues, our wonderful mayor and, and Sydney. Um, I, I think like everyone, I had a variety of emotions watching this film. Um, I expected to, to be traumatized by reliving uh, what happened in Pittsburgh and it certainly was traumatizing. I didn't expect to be so uplifted. Um, and the, the images of communities coming together, uh, seeing Jews and Muslims embrace and come to each other's aid, uh, to see Christians and Jews come together, black and white come together, uh, Asians experiencing the same, both uh, experience of being the subjects of hate, but also joining together in love for a fellow community uh, was, was just so uplifting. And it, it really brought to mind for me uh, what Martin Luther King said when he said that uh, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can. And hate cannot drive out hate, only love can. 
because you could see in the love for these communities for each other in the wake of this tragedy that hate was being driven out. Uh, and what I kept thinking was, how do we not wait for tragedy to bring us together? How do we not have to wait uh, for another terrible tragedy in our community or in another community before we come together uh, in love? And um, I also thought, and Karen, I'll be curious whether you had this reaction too, in watching those Im images from Charlottesville, uh, it brought me right back to January 6th. And um, during the, the January 6th hearings, the first hearing we had, we, we played the footage of the attack on the Capitol. And I was watching the Capitol Police officers watch this footage, which they had lived through. And, and even though we had been there and we had experienced it in different ways, uh, it was like experiencing it all over again. And, um, and what was the worst about that day was the realization, um, seeing the Confederate flags and the Auschwitz t-shirts, that this wasn't just an attempt to overturn an election, that this was a white nationalist effort. Um, and oh, I've kept coming back to, to the same uh, comment by the historian Robert Caro over the last several years. Uh, he said many years ago in an interview that power doesn't corrupt as much as it reveals. And, and I think power in the last several years revealed um, in a way perhaps we, we hadn't seen so graphically the, the deep vein of bigotry that's run through the country since its founding that is always there to be tapped by a demagogue. And now are, there are these powerful tools to amplify hate online. And, and this, to me, is one of the central challenges. Uh, and, and I think the answer is, is demonstrating the, the, the attraction, the appeal of coming together as a people. Um, there is an appeal to hate. If there wasn't, you wouldn't see so much of an explosion in hate. There is a community in hate. And, and we have to show the community of love for each other is much more powerful, much more inviting, much more something to be a part of than the community of hate. Uh, and so I, I, I'm drawn to, to thinking about ways where we can bring different communities together uh, and give a, a greater sense of the love among communities for each other, our, our shared experience. Well, I also want to thank Carl and Nick and Sam and Rabbi Browse and Aziza um, for the extraordinary work that you do, um, really each and every day stepping out um, on faith um, and into spaces that are oftentimes uncomfortable to remind us of the truth that's out there that we have to embrace. Um, you know, for me, the movie was the film, and a shout out to filmmakers and artists because I think they're actually part of the solution, a critical part of the solution, helping us to heal and <laughs> see things. Um, you know, I, I went to graduate school at Carnegie Mellon, so I, I went to school in Pittsburgh, and watching this film was actually encouraging for me um, because it was in Pittsburgh that I had such a hard time finding an apartment to rent because they, I had a number of landlords that didn't want to rent to a black student. Um, and it was in Pittsburgh where my girlfriend, who is lighter than me, was waiting across the street and a man rolled down the window at the stop sign and yelled at her, nigger, go home. So I have a different sense about Pittsburgh. So to actually see this film and I had friends that lived in Squirrel Hill and I lived in Shadyside, to see this film and a change of perspective was important for me because it was a city that was incredibly segregated and was not dealing with some of its own truths. You know, a steel town, very blue collar, um, resentment with um, different schools being there and, and um, all kinds of folks from across the world going to school there and tensions around poverty and unemployment. 
And I think we see that thread in so many other cities, um, both big and small, where communities are grappling with their existence and what coexistence means. And oftentimes we think coexistence has to be binary. I'm here and you're not. How do we share the small amount of crumbs that seem to be available for all of us? And in that um, is where fear is bred. And I think is where violence and intimidation and bullying um, and propaganda and rhetoric kind of thrive. Uh, I was reminded about a quote from another king, Coretta Scott King, that said, you know, freedom is part of the struggle that we have to fight and win with every generation. And so what was hopeful for me in the film were young people, young people stepping into uncomfortable spaces and wanting to commit to learn about each other um, and to own biases and maybe judgment um, and things that they don't know in order to find understanding and how can we replicate that across all spaces. Um, I was also struck by the fact that in this moment in time, we are fighting for democracy and we are fighting for freedom and we are fighting for life in this moment. You know, before it was the freedom to vote and then it was the freedom to love and now it's the freedom to be. And I sit in committees and I am astonished at what I hear. And a lot of it is, <laughs> it's rooted in ignorance. And while all of this is happening, we are a country trying to erase history. And history is not about trying to find another person to blame. It's actually about understanding your past so that you have a roadmap for how to make your future better. And when you are in spaces where we want to deny history, erase history, then we are destined to relive it. And the realities are there are so many horrors in our collective pasts that we should never ever want to animate and relive. I'm hopeful because to Adam's point, there is a community in healing and in truth, but we have to support and embrace and empower each other in those spaces so that we can build that kind of power. I'm still encouraged even in these crazy land committees and on the floor, if there are enough of us speaking truth to power and calling people out, there is silence on the other side. Now granted, they are kind of retooling another sort of, you know, rhetoric, um, you know, um, top line messaging that they can say, but if you keep at it, if you keep at it, people will find the strength in that truth. I just believe it. Um, we have to not succumb to fear or to apathy or to it's not me. Because, you know, James Baldwin did say to Angela Davis, uh, they will come for me in the morning if they came for you last night. And we have to remind ourselves that we could be next. Well, good evening, everyone. And uh, it is a real honor to be here with my two friends and colleagues, people who I have tremendous respect for, and Rabbi Bros. I go wherever she is. <laughs> <laughs> Our warrior for justice. Well, I didn't have the opportunity to see the film because I, I just arrived. But, <laughs> but let me just say, though, that um, you know I so remember uh, the massacre that happened. And actually, prior to last year's, I spent a great deal of time in Pittsburgh. So Pittsburgh has gotten a lot better. So I don't think I would be surprised by the solidarity that you talked about uh, in the film. But uh, we really are at an incredible crossroads. And uh, Adam, I was thinking about January 6th when you were talking and um, wondering whether or not it triggered it for you. Because uh, Adam and I were both there on January 6th, but what he hasn't said is that we all know that he was one of the main leaders uh, on impeachment. And, uh, and I, yeah, that's right, give him a round of applause. Um, 
And he had to deal with threats from people like the guy that did that massacre all the time, and I imagine you still do, uh, because he had to travel with uh, security. So those threats are still out there. And when I think about what happened at the Tree of Life, I also remember, you know, there were hate crimes that happened around then. You remember right before it was the guy, and it, you know, Trump instigated this because he said that uh, the guy that conducted the massacre, and I'm not sure if this was in the film, but he said that you know part of his reason was because of the conspiracy that Jewish folks were bringing people across the border. That was during the time when Trump said we needed to have the army on the border because we were being invaded. And a few weeks before the massacre, there was a guy that was leaving these fake bombs um, around everybody and they eventually caught him. Was that covered in the film? And, um, and he, when they caught him, his van was filled with all kinds of Trump paraphernalia. A few days before the massacre, there was a white supremacist guy who tried to go into a black church to repeat you know, what happened in South Carolina. He wasn't able to get in, so he killed two random folks, uh, African-American folks in a parking lot. And if I'm not mistaken, a few days after Tree of Life, a guy went in and massacred uh, women of color in a in a yoga studio, and I say that because the you know I mean that was the Trump forces that we're still dealing with, and and the thought that some of those people, I think some of the ones from January 6th, didn't some of them win their election? Are they in Congress? Yes. Yeah, they, I mean, yes. what? How did how, how did w did we get here with this? So this threat is very very real, and you said you know we won you know freedom to vote freedom to love, but they're trying to take both of that. I mean, especially the freedom to vote and, and building in the changes so that they could change the structure of, of elections. So the threat is real, but just to bring it home, you know, one of the things that I've been amazed by in the 100 plus days um, I've been uh, at City Hall is the vitriol that happens at City Hall at City Council meetings. And, and uh, Mike Fuhr, I'm, I'm sure you got your share of it now that you're uh, planning to be a part of, of my colleagues up here. But you know, to hear folks come to city council meetings and call folks the N-word and everything under the sun. In, and, and so, you know, we can't consider ourselves immune from this. And, uh, and I you know, feel very confident in our city that we are the overwhelming majority and we can defeat this, but it does go on right here. I mean, look at what we had here. I mean, the shooting, uh, the, the flyers. The flyers really bother me because I feel like that's like the beginning, you know? I mean, it's the flyer, then it's the banner, then it's the shooting. And, uh, and I'm hoping that we can actually find people through people's ring cameras. Uh, at some point where we can uh, stop it and put it out in its tracks. Thank you. I'm, I'm so grateful to all three of you. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here and for, really for just dedicating your lives uh, to working to build a different kind of reality. The realities that we build are often rooted in the stories that we tell, the dreams that we hold. And I want to invite up now Aziza Hassan, um, who is uh, a dear uh, friend and director of Newground, really one of the leading pioneers in the space uh, throughout the country in bringing Muslims and Jews together. Um, so thank you, Aziza, for being here tonight. And last but not least, really first tonight, is our filmmaker, Patrice O'Neill. Um, Patrice is, you heard from her at the very beginning of our evening tonight, Patrice is the director of Repairing the World and founder of Not In Our Town, an organization that works with communities across the country to stop hate. Um, she's really seen as a great pioneer in this field. Um, and Patrice, I am, I, I, as I said to you when we met, I'm absolutely blown away by, the, by, by what you've created here. Um, and especially by the way that you chose to tell this story. Um, Representative Kamala Gerdov spoke earlier about the effort to erase history, and I think that that will be a running thread throughout this. What does it mean for us to reckon honestly with what's happened, with what has happened, and what's happening now, so that we can dream together about what will come? But you made a very deliberate choice to tell this story in this way. 
Um, and I think that we often see, I'll just speak in the Jewish community, that, um, that when an anti-Semitic attack occurs, that different Jews tell different stories about it. Um, for some people, anti-Semitism is really a force of nature. There's a rising tide of anti-Semitism. It's gone viral. It's as if it's something that's always been part of history. We even say often um, it's the oldest history in the world, as if misogyny you know, didn't exist from the very beginning. Um, but some of us talk about it as if, it's, as if it's always been there and it will always be there and we just have to learn, the, the, the world hates us and we have to learn how to deal with it and strengthen our defenses. And others talk about it as kind of more of an intersectional reality, more, more of a kind of the mechanics of anti-Semitism. Somebody's profiting from anti-Semitism in a society. Who is it? Why are they using it? And who, benef who, who benefits from it? And what can we do about it? How can we dismantle the machinery of anti-Semitism? Um, some of us talk about it as if we alone are targets of this kind of hatred, and others as though hatred is truly, it, it, there, there are many impacted communities. Um, many of us are vulnerable to this, especially the white nationalist narrative that we've been speaking out about a little bit up here today. You chose to tell a very intersectional story here. Um, I'm so grateful for that narrative because I, I, that's the story I want our community to hear. That's the story I want my children to hear. Can you tell us a little bit about how you came to tell this story in this way and why you think it matters as an artist that we tell, uh, that we tell these kind of stories? Thank you so much for this question. And in context of that question, I want to introduce Zach Banner, a former Pittsburgh Steeler who is here with us tonight. He lives in the Los Angeles region. Zach, will you please stand up? I think he's so much a part of the story. Where are you? Standing, Zach. Thank you. Um, I think we follow stories. As, as all of this was taking place, we were seeing the rise in anti-Semitism, as I said earlier. And, and as my friend Eric Ward says, anti-Semitism is the ideological driver in the white power movement. And I think Zach sort of alluded to that. It's like if we understand that, we begin to unpack some of what you just spoke about. Um, what can we do about it? That has been my life's work, right? What can we do? And to see what unfolded in Pittsburgh, to see what was apparent on the ground, Shireen first went there, was to know that this is a story that can possibly move people into action in a new way. Pittsburgh created that. We decided to, to look for the light, to look for the light. And there was so much light. There is so much light in Pittsburgh. The racism that you spoke about, that hasn't gone away. Obviously, it hasn't. And it's part of the longer film where you know, there are more conversations about that and the challenges that remain. But there is an opening. And in this trauma that took place, I think the Jewish community played such a significant role. First of all, and let me just say this, they were prepared. They were prepared for this attack because of the relationships that they had built over time. It wasn't, it wasn't just suddenly, you know, Wasi Muhammad appears. He had Rabbi Meyer's phone number. They knew each other. These relationships were there, and these connections were there. And we have seen that over and over again in Not In Our Town stories over these decades. That is what we can do to begin to prevent hate, build those connections earlier. And so it is part of, I guess, what I have seen for so many years. When we do that, we strengthen ourselves. That is, that is one of the core ingredients of of hate crime prevention and intolerance. I do think that this discussion about the intersectional nature of understanding anti-Semitism and its relationship to racism and anti-immigrant violence against and uh, attacks on LGBTQ people, it's essential. We have, these are hard conversations. These are hard conversations and painful because everyone, there, there's so much pain and trauma, right? So how can, um, how can a story from some other place open up a discussion? That is our goal as filmmakers. That's what we want to do. How can seeing, seeing something from another place open 
open us to these hard, hard conversations about what we do next. Thank you. Aziza, I want to I invite you to speak, and then I'll ask if any of you want to um, offer some thoughts on this, too. Um, this idea of building relationships, of the essential nature of building relationships, is obviously so much at the heart of what's helped Pittsburgh survive through, um, as a city, you know, sur survive through this attack and really build something beautiful um, out of this terrible tragedy. There is a... There, it is really hard to um, to organize when we're full of fear and trauma, and because we have to break through our fear and trauma to actually see one another's humanity. And you, who've dedicated your career um, to building relationships um, in the most unlikely places, and Aziza has more Jewish friends than I do. I just want to say, so <laughs> as a as a Muslim in Los Angeles. Um, who's dedicated your life to making sure that it's not just you, but that our communities really find ways to each other. Can you talk a little bit about how we break through the sense of, uh, of fear and vulnerability that comes when you live in an impacted community so that we can actually find the courage to face one another um, with open hearts? I think we do it over and over and over again. The fear is there, and I keep going back to my personal experiences. At times I feel like I can do this, I step forward, and at other times I feel so stuck. And I think of Pittsburgh and that moment when Newground doesn't really statements, we do relationships. And at that moment, people were saying, you need to show, we want you to show up. And I knew we had to show up in the biggest possible way. And as I looked out across this, there was this huge gathering of people at the federal building. Um, right following the attack. It was here in Los Angeles. And I remember seeing a sea of faces of so many different people, and all of our people were there. And in that moment, we knew that we had to move past the fear. There was something that was calling on us to move forward. Um, and I, th and especially, I, I, so I'm, I'm looking at the sea of faces, and I see Andrea, and I see Omar, Hakeem, and I see this um, Make America Great Again, huge massive poster and a person there. And then there's another guy not too far and he's wearing a punch a Nazi t-shirt and it's clear that there's gonna be something. <laughs> and so Omar looks at one guy and Andrea looks at the other and they both literally turn their backs to each other because they know each other and they start to de-escalate the other people. Mm. And nothing happened and that was the point because people were willing to step forward because they trusted each other so deeply. And sometimes the fear is there, and other times we know that we just have to trust each other and lean on each other. And then I think to the march after, um, in 2019, and the, the awful that unfolded in New Zealand at Christ Church, also fueled by this idea that there was this great replacement theory and, and it's, it's more than in just the United States, it's gone beyond. And I remember thinking, here I am in my mosque, this place where I feel scared to be, and yet it was, again, filled to the brim with people of all different faiths. And there they were, just standing there, and there are people that I've seen at synagogues and churches across the city, and I would have never dreamed they would be in our space, and here they were. And then afterwards, one of the rabbis made it possible for me to, to be with our head of security to, to literally case the Islamic Center where I worship. And I remember being, walking around with him and just seeing all the places where the Islamic Center was vulnerable, and my fear just sunk me deep into the ground, and I felt like I could hardly move. And he noticed like how, like how my body language just changed, and he's like, it's okay, you can't cover everything. And in that real moment, and, and as I tried to digest it, because it's still in my heart and my, my, my breath literally just sticks and I can hardly breathe again, I realized that it's not always about how we make ourselves safe with weapons or all these specific ways that we make all these precautions. What makes us safe is what Mossy was talking about, which is these relationships that show up for you over and over again and redefining what it is to be a neighbor, that my, like, that, that, that you are there for me and I am there for you, and that when we are truly there for each other, that's what truly makes us safe. 
And so that's what helps me work through the fear. It's knowing that people will be there for me. And this last Sunday, yesterday actually, I was back at the Islamic Center with my nine-year-old and a whole bunch of religious leaders were there and they were um, praying and, uh, and, and speaking from, from, the, from the pulpit. And it came time for prayer and this place where I have felt so much fear so many times became a place where I could literally turn my back to them when it was time to pray. And my nine-year-old was there with me and we were both praying, totally knowing that even with our backs to the others, they would have us and that we could fully worship in the way that we needed to be. And I think of the Los Angeles that is and that can be, and that's why we have to just find our way, even when we don't know what the next step will be, that we move forward and that we continue to be there for each other. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Aziza. I, I've, shared, um, I've shared with my community many times one of the most profound experiences that I had almost immediately after Trump was elected when we had a gathering at the Islamic Center and there were clergy members uh, from all around the city, but it was mostly Latino clergy members who were there. And I remember that somebody from the Islamic Center got up and said, we understand that under this new regime, we are really, the, we're gonna be on the front lines. And he said, and I want to tell you to our Latino brothers and sisters in Los Angeles that this Muslim community opens our arms to you and we embrace you with love. You will always be safe in the Islamic Center. And I really was so struck by this moment because um, while, while I think it, it was arguably true that the Latino brothers and sisters were on the front lines, uh, the Muslims were not far behind uh, in that. And, and, and even from that incredible vulnerability that they could say our first task is to take care of one another was really, was really extraordinary. I'm curious for the three of you, um, I think we've already established that some of the folks that are your colleagues at work um, are, are in fact some of the source of the real, of, of the problem in our country. Um, how, how do you push through? I mean, you've been, you have been, as, we, as, as Mayor Bass has said, the target of anti-Semitic attacks in addition to many other kinds of, um, of targeted uh, attacks. Both of you, um, as really strong black women in this country and important leadership positions have been um, the targets of both misogyny and anti-black racism. Um, how, do you con how do you continue? I'm gonna ask you to answer the same question I asked Aziza, but we, I mean, organizing uh, and stepping forward through fear is not necessarily the best way um, to, to, to find our way to each other. Um, and yet you're confronting really extraordinary challenges. So I want to invite you to reflect, if you would, on, on how you find a way to continue to persist in the work despite um, these enormous personal challenges to you and your safety and your community safety. Uh, well, sometimes it's uh, one day at a time. Um, sometimes I get up in the morning and, and say, I just got to get through the day. Uh, and at the end of the day, I say, I'm still standing a little bit with some surprise. Um, you know, I, I was struck by um, something in the film when the, the scholar says it begins with words. Um, because I have seen now over and over and over again um, when, for example, I'm attacked by the former president or one of the talking heads on Fox, it is immediately amplified on social media. And, you know, within 24 hours, it becomes death threats. Mm -hmm. And so you see words at a rally amplified on social media to threats of death. Right. Uh, and, you know, those, those threats of death, um, they reach a lot of people and they reach people who are unwell. Um, or they reach people who are ready to act. Uh, and it's, you know, mere fortuity and a terrible fortuity um, who is uh, ultimately the subject of that attack. But, but we see um, so often uh, in the examples that Karen was giving of these people who uh, go to Walmart and shoot people because they're trying to kill immigrants and go to the Tree of Life because they're trying to shoot Jews, um, how it started with words and it started with amplification. Um, I wrote to uh, Elon Musk in December about the, the escalation, the, the acceleration of hate since he took over that company, since he took over Twitter. Um, and at the time I wrote to him, uh, anti-Semitism had increased 60%. 
Um, Anti-LGBT hate had increased about the same. Um, and when I wrote to him, and I, I wrote to him with Mark Takano, one of my Asian LGBT colleagues, um, we published our letter, and, and of course, Mark was hit with a barrage of L, uh, anti-LGBT hate, and I got a rash of anti-Semitic hate, uh, and the response from Elon Musk was, I'm glad you're losing your chairmanship. You have a very small brain. Um, uh, so I wrote to him again in March, because I don't learn my lesson, um, <laughs> because there were new studies that now it was the, the anti-Semitic uh, hate on his platform was up over 100%. Uh, as well as other forms, and the, the anti-black bigotry, and anti-Latino bigotry, uh, and, and tragically, the anti-Muslim bigotry has always been prevalent on Twitter. Um, and, uh, and I don't know who's ever read their Twitter feed lately, it's a cesspool. Uh, and, and so, this is an online community of hate. Uh, and and we, have to, we have to figure out how do we deal with the online community of hate because that translates into hate in the real world uh, and hate with consequences. Uh, and so when we talk about speaking out against hate, we need to speak out against it in the virtual as well as the real world. Um, and, and, and I don't think that means just sort of tweeting back, but rather having a very public discussion of, of what a cesspool some of these social media platforms have become. Uh, I mean, there are legislative remedies that we are looking at, but, but the most important remedy is for people to speak out uh, about what has become of these uh, communities of expression online. And, and the last example I would give is, I offered an amendment recently in the Judiciary Committee, which I thought would be fairly non-controversial. We were discussing, of course, with Jim Jordan and Matt Gates, everything is, um, a little crazy, um, but we were deciding the jurisdiction of the Judiciary Committee and I offered an amendment to say that we should oversee the rise of domestic violent extremism as characterized in particular by um, anti-AAPI hate, by anti-Semitism, and by white nationalism. And the result was to be accused of excessive wokeism, um, I was asked, why am I so fixated on anti-Semitism? What about anti-Christian bigotry um, and the like? And of course, it was voted down. Um, and, you know, but, but the answer is you don't give up. You just keep pushing back. Um, I, we will get through this dark period of our history. I have every confidence we'll get through it. But I think what we do in this moment will determine how quickly we get through it and, and how much damage we suffer along the way. But we... We have to keep pushing back. So I'm actually encouraged by my class, the freshman class. I feel like most of us uh, who won probably uh, could have um, taken a much better job that was private and high paying um, with better vacations. Uh, so, so, so this wasn't the pinnacle, you know, and I think when you, when you, when you come in with that kind of um, reality, you're able to deal with where you are, right? You're not afraid of, of, of losing the seat. And with that brings courage. You know, and I think I'm in a class, and we are so unafraid and unapologetic about calling out all of the madness and danger that we hear from these people. I mean, we literally had a woman who, um, you know, said you could only be a mother if you were a biological parent. You know, we've had people who've said, there are tons of Chinese balloons floating in the air, just ask the retired you know, pilots who are at the beach drinking and they will tell you where all of them are located. I mean, we have had, you know, we have had um, bills on the floor that were anti-trans, anti-LGBTQ, anti-women, um, because they don't have anything else. So it's how can we stoke all of these culture wars? And the positive note is that there are a number of us who are just already tired of hearing it and are unafraid and unabashed in speaking up. 
Um, having said it, there is a relentless barrage of this every single day. Um, you know, I was in a committee and the first organizational meeting we had was a discussion about being able to bring guns and grenades to the committee. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know what a grenade has to do with the oceans, because it's a natural resources committee. <laughs> but, and I asked the question, I didn't get an answer. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's also the same committee where a colleague said that there were not enough African Americans uh, in Louisiana to warrant uh, protecting them against toxins. Um, and the focus should instead be on whites and Cajuns uh, because they were more important. And then when I called him out on it, he asked me to apologize. <laughs> so I say it to say, that can also bring fear, right? I'm the only black woman on this committee. Um, we are not always there together because in Congress, they have the committees meet at the same exact time and you're on multiple committees. I don't understand this. Um, <laughs> so oftentimes there's maybe only two or three of us and there will be many more Republicans because they have to hold quorum. And you know, that can bring with it some fear. These people you see on TV want to call you out and yell and say bad things and berate you. I, I heard a, one of my colleagues berate one of the secretaries and he said, you know, I used to be in sales. I can read body language, talk about misogyny. And I'm reading your body language. You're afraid, you're tense, you're lying. You don't know your information. He didn't say that to the male witnesses. It's important to be vulnerable. And so I go to work oftentimes and I say, I'm just gonna lean into the vulnerability and I'm gonna believe in the universe that it will embrace me and allow me to get through this hearing or deal with these things that I have to hear. And oftentimes, I mean, if you think about it, we're always afraid. You might be afraid to go on that first date. You might be afraid to go into a meeting where you don't feel prepared. You might be afraid to have that hard discussion with a family member or a loved one. You still lean into it because you know it's something you have to do. And oftentimes, more often than not, the universe responds and gives you the kind of courage that you need to go into that new space. And I, I just don't believe that the universe will let us down in that way. And then what you do is you find your other words and you call people on it. And I do believe that when you call people on it in maybe less aggressive ways, you're able to hit something inside of them to bring pause. And it's how do you extend it? So I'll, ju I'll just add that the person who said it was okay for black people to die in Louisiana, my second response was to send him a couple of books from Brian Stevenson's Legacy Museum about lynching. Uh, to say, okay, let's, if we're gonna have a discussion about black people, let's start with some education and then have a different kind of conversation. Um, so how do you meet people where they are and then ask them to push a little further um, using good words um, and just remaining vulnerable and also finding courage in that vulnerability. Uh, when you mentioned the um, Brian Stevens and lynching, uh, we did just outlaw lynching two years ago. So, I mean, that bill had tried to get through the house and sent it right at him for many, many, many years. You know, as I uh, listen to my two colleagues here, one thing that they didn't mention is, is that when we go through attacks, it's not just us. I mean, when you go on, if you ever do, uh, go on Fox anymore, <laughs> when you, well, what you do, you do go on. And, uh, and then right afterwards, your office gets a barrage of calls and you just think about it, because the young people 
and it's always young people that are answering the phones in our offices are really traumatized. Mm -hmm. I know in my office they wouldn't tell me uh, that they would just panic every time I and I didn't do Fox that often, but they knew they were going to get hit with calls, and so it's not just us that is attacked; it's all the people around us that have to hear that, you know, as well. And even though we could kind of joke and not take um, the replacement theory, the replacement theory seriously, I do think we should, because I do believe that's at the foundation of a lot of this. And I think that there's a segment of our country that was so traumatized by that black family moving into the White House that they just still haven't recovered. And, and what they realized is that the demographics of this country is changing fundamentally. And in a minute, the United States is gonna look like California. And that is very threatening. Thank you, I think that's a good thing too. <laughs> They're realizing the demographics are changing, and so their first strategy was voter suppression and, and uh, g gerrymandering, redistricting. But if people, if the demographics fundamentally change, you can't just erase everybody out, so then you have to change the structure of elections. So I think these are, are very serious you know, things that we need to uh, keep in, in mind. But when you ask me how do I carry on, I, my, my view is, how dare I not carry on? You know, what right do I have to say that, you know, I get afraid or can't move on? I am rooted in my history and know what happened in this country for 256 years, that this country still will not acknowledge the enslavement, the torture, the murder of black people over 256 years, obviously years before our country was formed, and then the 100 years after enslavement of apartheid. And then we have you know, uh, integration for five minutes and then all the laws change back. So it's like, how dare I, given what my ancestors went through, how dare I say I can't handle what you know, I've gone through? So that gives me strength and determination I do think, though, that humor is really important to survival. And so, I mean, it is. I mean, because, you know, you go in that room and somebody's really arguing that they want to bring a grenade. And yeah, yeah. to, you know, or you, you see Mar Marjorie Taylor Greene and it's like, you know, are you literate? Anyway, <laughs> but, 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 but you do have to find humor. That's a part of us, you know, uh, surviving. I thank you so much for sharing that. I, I was really moved by um, in there, this one of the scenes in the in the film when the grandson. You saw a little bit of the yard site, the anniversary of the death of Rose um, Malinger. Is that how you say her name? And she and so one of her grandkids is talking, and he said, "I don't think of myself as a religious person, but I think I feel more connected to my Jewish identity now than I did before." You think about the the, the high schooler. The high schoolers pulled together this massive vigil. Um, that, that evening after the shooting, and this, and this young girl said, I'm a different Jew today than I was yesterday. And sometimes the, these encounters with hatred and, and with trauma, and when we recognize our true vulnerability, actually reinforce for us the depth of our connection to our own roots and to our own stories. And it's something that you bring out very beautifully um, in, in the piece, so I, I really want to thank you for that. And I, I will say I remember the Shabbat after tr the Tree of Life shooting at Ikar, and I'm sure many of you were there. Um, it was, we were upstairs um, outside, and it was absolutely packed. I mean, there were just hundreds and hundreds of people who we don't usually see, um, uh, who weren't regulars, who were there on Shabbat, and it felt like there was this sense of determination that at the, in some ways the, the harder this is, the more clear I am which side of history I need to stand on. And I think I really just, I feel, I, I so deeply appreciate that. And also, you know, where do we go from here? And how do we hold the attachment, the wakeful awareness of our vulnerability and the need to connect with one another profoundly 
when it's not in the immediate aftermath of a mass shooting, um, when as these things sort of tend to you know, move out of the news cycle fairly quickly, how do we continue to hold on to the fierce sense of urgency around ending gun violence, around you know, getting rid of these anti-trans legislation, pieces of legislation all around the country now? And I mean, it's, it's grotesque. This is a war on trans people, already some of the, the most highly impacted people in, in the country, and it's actually grotesque. How do we continue to hold the, the, the fierce urgency of now, the fevered desire for a just and loving society once the news crews leave and, and, and we settle back into a kind of more comfortable um, status quo. And, and I think you bring some of this in the film. I mean, looking at it oh, one year later, two years later, three years later, I'm um, really, this is something I think a lot about as a spiritual leader, um, because it's our work to continue to stir people up so that we don't fall back asleep. But each of you in your own work, I think, is, is dealing with this um, when, when, the mo when it can't be resolved now, but we feel the urgency now, how do we not lose touch with that urgency so that we can build a, a kind of long-term different, uh, different future? I wonder if, if, that's, if that lifts anything to the surface for any of you. Thanks, yeah. the setup. Um, I, I mean, I think there are so many concrete things that can be done, really concrete things, at the federal level, at the local level. Our work is focused at the local level. What can we do in our communities to convene these conversations and shift the social norms around hate speech? What can we do? You, we saw that happening in Pittsburgh. The legal battles will continue for a long time. It's incredibly complex. I'm sure you're dealing with that in Congress, but we can do something right now. There's so much power in convening and pulling people together to say, what can we do together? It happened tonight. It can happen over and over again. But part of, I think, the role of the federal government and local and state government is giving local communities the support they need and the structures they need to make to allow this to happen, right? To like. Let's have this conversation. Let's have this dialogue. I mean, it needs to happen with volunteers, with local people who are motivated to do this. People want to do something. That is clear. It was clear from the beginning with Not In Our Town. It's clear in our history. People want to do something. They need to be given the opportunities and the space to do it. And so that's in our power to do. We can do that. And every person in this room has the power to do that. I hope it can happen. But. There's a lot to be done. There's great programs here. LA, LA's for all, um, LA versus hate, um, trying to monitor and report hate crimes so that community can respond. Like when something happens, what do we do together? Be prepared, be ready, and be there to respond when something happens. And we begin to build those connections. So, you know, it's happening. We could do more. And I hope that people will think about how they can use this film in that endeavor. Thank you. Um, Aziza, I'm going to go to you in, in just a moment, but thank you for saying that, Patrice. And by the way, our, our plan is that we're going to close in just a couple of minutes. So we're going to hear a kind of closing, uh, after we after this question is answered, we have a couple of closing words and then um, and then we'll wrap. Um, but, but Representative Schiff, you said something. You said there's community and hate. And I just thought that was... Uh, it's so profound. Part one of the things I'm most concerned about right now in our country is that th this isolation, loneliness, social alienation. Hannah Arendt says these are preconditions for tyranny. That people need to feel apart from one another in order to become captivated with ideas like QAnon and Trump and MAGA and you know and all of the all of the kind of toxins that are in the system in the country right now because it pulls them toward, they're intoxicating, and then there's, there's a sense of belonging that comes from attaching to them. To counter that, I think, Patrice, you're exactly right. It's about us finding our way to each other, um, not in communities of hate, but in communities of love and justice. So I thank you so much for that. Aziza, I saw that you had something to say, and then we'll, we'll have one final word from each of our panelists, and we'll close this beautiful night. Thank you. Um, there is community in hate, and just as there is community in hate, one of the, in the 83, I think, minute version, um, which I think everyone here should watch, uh, they talk about um, hate, they talk about actually the, the importance of community for healing. And I'm witnessing one event after the next, and it feels like we're reliving these events over and over and over again, and enough is enough. And unfortunately, it feels like more is yet to come. And yet, 
community and being there for each other is also really essential and it's part of the healing. And as I'm like looking at so many people around me, I'm seeing people who are just eager and wanting healing. And that's where I think we can especially catapult and, and, and continue to build healing spaces and centers for each other um, because I think that will sustain what needs to be a huge movement. Um, and then also what you were saying about convening spaces for hard conversations, if you think back to that moment when the high school student said, we actually need courageous spaces of non-judgment for us to be able to share ideas and, and, and really actually meet people where they are, like that's where it's at. This problem, like you were saying, it's, it, it's huge on Twitter, it's huge on social media, it's growing. It's growing and we have to take it seriously. And if we're gonna take it seriously, we have to create those spaces for community, for healing, for having public forums, like you can join Newgrounds tomorrow. We're gonna to be talking about anti-Semitism on Zoom at 12.30 um, because this is not an issue that's gonna go away. It's something that we have to be able to talk about and take very seriously. And last, you're, like you were saying, there's so many opportunities for all of us. I'm also a commissioner on the Civil Rights Commission at the City of Los Angeles. There's a huge campaign and you see these signs all over the city. It's LA for all. It's in different languages all over. You can see it in Hebrew, you can see it in Arabic, you can see it in French. You can pick up your poster as you're walking out today. Um, I have to tell you, like I, I talk about my, where my work all the time with my kids, and they're like, whatever, mom. <laughs> but somehow, these posters, every time we drive anywhere by any center, they're like, mom, look, that's your work. And then I'm like, okay, well, if that's the one thing you took from my work, sure, that's great. Because LA truly is for all, and we all need to be able to say that. I'm just going to ask if the three of you would mind lifting up for us a vision. Sometimes we're, we're really pulled into the trenches and we're so hard at work that we, it, it, it helps a little bit to, um, to step out and offer up what the vision is. And, and we talk a lot about the, build, the vision of building a true multiracial democracy in this country, a, a vision of reckoning, a vision of you know, racial justice and, and, and true love and inclusion. But I'm curious what the driving vision is for you um, of what you believe to be possible. Um, we know that anti-Semitism is not only a threat to Jews, but is really the bellwether of a society, is a threat to all people who believe in democracy. We know that the same is true about anti-black racism. We know the same is true about anti-Asian hate. We know that these, these are toxins in the system. What is the vision that we pull ourselves out of the toxicity in order to, uh, in, in order to be our, our guiding light so that we can know what we're striving for in these days? You want me to start? Yes. <laughs> well, it's interesting that you mentioned the student in the film because I thought one of the most profound moments in the film was when one of the students said that this tragedy had allowed uh, her to get to know other students and other perspectives. Uh, she said, before now, I really didn't have the courage to speak to people uh, outside my own community. And when I get older, I realize there's a chance that I'm gonna fall back into being only comfortable in my own community. And you had a sense of just how narrow that window is. And I was thinking, you know, how do we open that window? How do we um, make that last? One of the things that makes me optimistic about the future is that young people have no patience for bigotry. They have no patience for this scourge of gun violence. They've grown up with active shooter drills their entire education, and they're not going to put up with it. And, um, and if we can find a way to, to keep, um, to keep that... that uh, willingness to engage with each other, um, then there, there, there's so many reasons to be optimistic. I, I want to tell you about one very brief moment of optimism that I had in committee recently. We had a debate over guns in the Judiciary Committee, not generally a moment for any form of optimism. Um, in, in this particular case, um, there are these devices that you can strap onto an assault pistol to convert a assault weapon pistol into an assault rifle. Uh, it's something that essentially lets you extend the barrel to your shoulder so that you have more stability when you're shooting an assault weapon so you can kill more people. And 
What the ATF did is they decided that if you strap on one of these devices, you're essentially creating an assault rifle and it needs to be registered as an assault rifle. So it wasn't saying you couldn't have the device, it wasn't saying they were prohibited, it was just saying that if you make a rifle, you need to register it like any other assault rifle. Well, you would think that the ATF had decided to abolish all firearms from the reaction that there's a very, very modest step um, uh, uh, resulted in. And so in the committee, you can imagine what the debate was like. Uh, and from my point of view, there is probably no single issue other than gun violence that makes me so angry and so frustrated because it doesn't have to be this way. Uh, and, and I thought after Sandy Hook that surely now, after seeing these beautiful children mowed down, surely now we'll do something. And of course we didn't. Um, so we have this contentious debate. And I'm not sure any of the folks on the other side of the aisle heard anything we were saying or we heard anything they were saying until it got to a guy named Glenn Ivey from Maryland. And Glenn Ivey um, started by saying something to the effect of addressing people on the other side of the aisle. You can't be happy with this situation either. I mean, you can't be happy with, with this constant drumbeat of mass tragedy. You can't like it any more than we do. I mean, surely there's something that we can do together on this. And it was really quite an amazing moment because they were listening and so were we. And, and it's, it happens so rarely on an issue of such significance, but nonetheless such division and controversy, that someone can break through. Um, it's, it's much less rare among young people. Um, they're much less set in, in their ways, and they don't, they don't come to it with the same baggage that, that we do. And, and so um, I, I think part of our focus much of our focus has to be on young people um, and getting young people to be able to form those communities across lines and maintain those communities. Um, I was thinking about uh, listening to Adam and <clears throat> thinking about when I um, went to Israel and we went to... Um, the wall, we were in Jerusalem, and I remember asking um, one of my colleagues who was there with me, okay, so who is Jewish and who is Muslim? Because there was a moment where everyone looked the same. How they were praying, how they were walking, how they were connecting with their partner. And I remember thinking, how is there so much tension in this space when there's so so much that seems to be common between those that are fighting with each other. And I only was able to think about it because I had quieted myself to receive. And we have got to do more listening, more seeing. We have got to find the quietness so that we can actually hear what is being said and how people are feeling, and go to that place in order to find solutions and in order to build relationships. Congress is a place where people are just talking at each other, they're reading the scripts, and it's very rare that you are able to pierce the bubble and actually either hear something or say something that resonates. Um, we have a gun violence task force. It is one of the more active caucuses or task forces in Congress, and we were charged over the last two weeks to go find Republicans <laughs> and ask them what they are willing to work on um, as it relates to gun violence prevention. And we have these cards, and we divvied up the list, um, and I went and found my five or six to ask them, and I said, no judgment. I, I'm not interested, I'm not gonna debate the answer, but just tell me. And just had conversations and listened, and some of it was outlandish, but a lot of it wasn't. And people did have places where they wanted to start. 
but they're not used to you coming and asking a question and just listening. And so how do we continue to do that? And I mean, I would never say who they are. I would never blast it out because I, I wouldn't want to disrupt the progress. But that gives me hope because the reality is everyone is impacted by some of the, the legislation that we do, every single person, Republican and Democrat, is impacted. I think the issue with the trans is that there aren't enough, the trans issue is that maybe there are not enough Republicans that know someone who is transgender. But everyone quietly has a story about someone who was killed, or about someone who was LGBT, or about some of the uh, woman who had to deal with an abortion. And so how are we creating spaces where we can listen to those stories and then build connections that will allow us to find solutions that will keep people alive? And when I listened to you, Sydney, and you said that you wouldn't reveal their names because you wanted progress to continue, well, the other reason you can't reveal their names is because then they'll be threatened. You know, seriously. And I, I do think we have to deal with the reality that the Republican Party has been taken over by an extremist element and that they are not allowed to say stuff publicly or they will be under fierce attack. Um, but, you know, when I think of when your, your question was what the vision, what is the vision? And, uh, and I'm not saying this just to butter you up, but, you know, I, I do think that Rabbi Bros is a perfect example of the vision because of the type of spiritual leader you are. Uh, you always offer light and an invitation to bring people in and inclusion. You always see other people's pain and you lead your congregation that way. And so because you know that the crisis of the unhoused is a problem that impacts our city, then ECAR now says they're gonna build housing. And to me, that's right. Um, and you know, we're talking about a lot of things here and I, I can't be up on this stage and not mention that uh, because we do have this problem that's happening right in our city that impacts all of us, whether we are housed or unhoused. And it's an area that we can all participate in. And it's also an area that has become a, um, uh, a place of divisiveness right here in liberal LA, where people now are like, those folks are there because they wanna be there, they're just addicted. And then, you know, what is unsaid, of course, is the extreme racial disparity as to who's under those tents. You know, 74% being black and brown. Um, black folks are 9% of LA or 8, 34% of the people in the tents, 44% are Latino. This is a crisis that could provide a source of unity for our city where we could all come together and say we have skin in the game, people are dying on our streets before our very eyes, and it's an opportunity for us to come together. And so my vision is looking for those opportunities, not waiting for the shooting, not waiting for the hate crime, but being proactive. And that's how I also think of your leadership. And so all of us have a role to play, all of us have a way to participate, and I just, appreciate you bringing this um, gathering together. And of course, my two colleagues here and the two folks who were responsible for the film today. So thank you so much. Thank you. I, I'm, uh, I'm very gr humbled by your words and really moved by the activists in, in our community that are working so hard on this housing project. and partnering with you to build a better Los Angeles and to build a better America is 100% our priority. Um, I, I, I'm also just really grateful that none of you said that the only way to stop a, a bad guy with a gun is more good guys with guns in our institutions. And so I want to thank you for, um, for, for really um, in, in inspiring us. And, um, you know, I, I, after the two Jewish men were shot in, um, in the Pico Robertson area a couple of weeks ago by a guy who said he was out Jew hunting, we had this town hall at Eula, and I went there, and you know, you're very busy people, and I, um, there, were, there were 
I think, 16 elected officials who showed up that night to show um, our Jewish community that they stand with us in solidarity. And it was, it was very impactful. It meant a lot to me as a rabbi in the community, and I also felt um, I really only hope and pray that, um, God forbid, when the next tragedy happens in another community that's not our own, that our Jewish community shows up in such a show of force as we saw um, you as electeds and you, Aziza, as a you know as a as a partner um, in the multi faith world, show up for us. Um, so I, I want to just close the night um, by thanking our artists, um, our activists, and our electeds, all of whom are working. Um, to bring about the just and loving future that we know to be possible, and reminding all of us that we're here not only to receive the strength that comes from solidarity, but also ourselves to be, uh, to, double, to redouble our efforts to show up in this, uh, in this struggle. Thank you to the amazing Sam Hutman. Thank you to our co-sponsors, to Carl and to Nick, and to Nick and Ben and Elise and Susan, um, who are all here um, helping out tonight. And thank you all for being with us.